going to talk about agency based and rational thought occurs, the logic of physics, the structure and logic of biology, structure and function of the brain, the link contextual effects via biomolecules, abstract entities can have causal powers, and as Paul Davies said, physics by itself is not causally complete. So life emerges out of physics in a bottom-up way. Atoms are made of electrons and protons, molecules of atoms, cells and molecules, physiological systems including brains out of cells and organisms out of physiological systems. How can agency, with its manifestly occurs in this context, be compatible with physics in the physical world? Emergence of higher level contextually branching dynamics is made possible by downward causation, whereby lower levels, including the underlying physical levels, are conscripted to higher level purposes. The higher levels are thereby causally infected. No, no violation of physical laws is implied. The key point is that outcomes of universally applicable generic physical laws depend on the biological context when applied in specific real world situations. And there on the right is the hierarchy, fundamental theory of particle physics, nuclear physics, atomic physics, chemistry, biochemistry, cell biology, physiology, psychology, sociology, economics, politics. And in thinking about this, one must very clearly think about which levels one is talking about. Now, agency based in rational thought occurs. The power of thought goes from purposes to muscles. And so here's an example, a Pilates class. The teacher has an idea of purpose. She's got a specific exercise plan in mind, and that exercise plan is an abstract thing. From that, she gives instructions to the pupil. The pupil forms intentions according to that abstract plan. That makes muscles move, and that makes electrons flow in her, uh, in her muscles, which make her body move in accord with the abstract plan. The abstract plan is the causal agent which is making things occur. So the flow of causation is the molecules and the muscles move according to the plan in the instructor's mind. This is top-down causation from a concept to motion of electrons in the muscles. The electrons do not cause it, they enable it. Here, again, is another example, a computer simulation of an aircraft, an abstract design. And that, again, as I emphasize, it's an abstract. It's not a physical thing. It can be realized in many ways. You can draw it. You can have it in a computer. You can talk about it and so on. In fact, no single person has got the entire plan of that aircraft in their mind because it is far too complicated. On the right is the physical object, which the embodiment of that abstract design and the causation is from the abstract design to the physical object. It's an example of downward action of the mind to the levels of materials and molecules. A physical aircraft is the product of logical analysis of aerodynamics, structures, control systems, fuels, and so on and so on. At the psychological level, you think about this at the level of psychology in terms of that previous slide, and it acts down into your fingers who type out stuff on a computer, and that results in the, the existence of the aircraft. And this has taken place by the power of equations. We have articulated in our minds used in engineering design. This is a wonderful book, 17 Equations That Change the World. And it is the equations which underline the existence of that aircraft, for instance, in, in simulating the flow of air, of air over the wings and under the wings so that the wing design will be optimized. So mathematical equations, which are abstract entities, change the world through the human mind, which comprehends them and uses them in design. Now, how is this, can this fit with the logic of physics? And as, and as we've heard, physics is Hamiltonian dynamics with unique outcomes, a single railway tract, and no branching. Classical physics determines the evolution of a physical system by energy and momentum conservation, a force law, Dragonian, or Hamiltonian. The context C consists of boundary and can state equations, and the dynamical law uniquely determines the state of the relevant variables which is the position and momenta at any later earlier times from suitable initial conditions, which are the energy, the position and momenta at an initial time. So if at time t1, you've got the initial data, then at a time t2, the outcome is a function h of, the con of x, the initial data, and the time which depends on the constraints. And the constraints is a relation between some parameters and the variables and their time derivatives. Let's take a very simple example, which is a pendulum. A bob on an ideal massless rod swings backward and forward about a hinge without friction. The rod angled from the vertical is theta. The bob mass is m. The length is l. 
the position and time are given by the standard relations. It gives us constraint equation. L is root x is x root of square root, square root of x squared plus y squared, and that length is a constant. The kinetic and potential energy given by standard results, and the constraint is crucial. It swings on an arc because of that constraint. So if it didn't have the constraint, it would just fall to the floor. So the constraint determines what happens to billions of molecules that make up the blob. The Lagrange, and you write down the Lagrange equations of motion, and you get the equation of motion, number six there. And the initial data, theta and theta dot, uniquely determine the solution for all times, whether the t greater or less than the initial data, hence the dynamic is deterministic, and the present time t has no special significance. Logic and structure of biology is completely different. Biology has modular hierarchical structures which are the basis of complexity. All truly complex systems, whether logical or physical, are based on modular hierarchical structures with an overall function. Structure underlies function, shapes what happens. It's hierarchical with different levels of emergent complexity. It's modular with abstraction and information hiding. It's, it's got networks and interactions between modules from causal networks of preferred network motifs and hubs. And all living systems are of this nature where the structural and functional details have been determined by Darwinian evolutionary processes. And these are just two pictures of that by various people. Now, contextual branching dynamics takes place in biology. Biological causation at every level of the hierarchy tends to further the function alpha of a trait 3 T through contextually informed branching dynamics. In its simplest form, the logic is of, of the form given a context T. If a truth function T is positive, then do F1. If, if is 1, then do F1. If it's 0, do F2. Now, X is a contextual variable which can have many dimensions. Y and Z are also variables that can have many dimensions. The truth function is a truth value of arbitrary evaluative statements depending on X. It can arise from any combination of Boolean operations and mathematical operations. First really important example is gene regulatory networks where branching dynamics is controlled by transcription factors. Branching operations at the molecular level of cell signaling pathway can be regulated by transcription factors that control the transcription of genes through the lock and key molecular recognition mechanism, which is the basis of supramolecular chemistry, which has been known since Fisher's work in 1894 and is written about by Jean-Marie Lane in his book on supramolecular chemistry. The transcription factors may be on that may be able to bind to DNA or off, in this way controlling transcription of DNA to messenger RNA and so protein. So the transcription factors TF1 mod modulate synthesis of proteins in a metabolic pathway, embodying branching logic of the form if TF2 is on, then X2 goes to X3, else it doesn't. And that's of this way, if this, then that, otherwise something else happens. That's branching logic. And this is what allows contextual epigenetic control of gene expression. And this is a diagram from Wikipedia. You've got input molecules on the left, and those bind to the regulatory section of the gene. You've got another input which inhibits, and that determines the transcription and the output. The logic is, is that the input signals go to the gene regulatory network. Components go to the primary outputs, which are changed RNA and protein complexes. Those give you ch changed cell behavior and structure, and mm -hmm. that's the basic control process of a gene regulatory network. The logic is if input AI, then output OI, and if this, it is this logic that controls what happens. Any other realization can be used in those modules provided it implements the same logic, so you've got multiple realizability. You want to produce the output AI I goes to uh, OI, you want that logic, and you don't mind how it's implemented as long as it is implemented. A higher level regulatory factor centered to a macro variable such as blood pressure or heart rate can modulate the synthesis of intermediate enzymes and local transcription factors enabling top-down control of the process. So this is Dennis Noble's model of the heart. These are flow calculations coupled to a deforming heart. Color coding represents transmural pressures acting on coronary vessels due to the myocardial system. So the system as a whole, it's a very, very complex uh, system of flows, and that causes pressures which are very, very high in the red domain, and that affects what happens in those cells. There's a downward effect from non-local variables, which is the myocardial variables, to the level of the coronary vessels which respond to those stresses. And so Dennis Noble has this diagram here, uh, 
contextual epigenetic control takes place of the lower level biological processes by high level physiological states. The organism sends signals to the cells which change their behavior, and the cells and the organs send signal down to the gene regulatory networks which change the genes, change the expression of genes, and result in different proteins and cell behavior. And this, now, if we go specifically to the central nervous system, you have the hierarchical structure shown there, and the, ce the cellular level is the level of neurons. And the dense interconnection of neurons in a cortical column are what make us all different. The differences between each of us are in the details of this neural network, which is determined by adaptation to the environment. Neural plasticity underlies memory and learning. Now, this is a very important slide here. Eric Kandel is a Nobel Prize winner for his work on memory in the brain. And he says, all altered gene expression underlies memory and learning. All mental processes derive from operations of the brain. Genes determine neuronal functioning. Social and developmental factors contribute importantly to the variance in mental illness. These factors express themselves in altered gene expression. Nurture is ultimately expressed as nature. Altered gene expression induced by learning gives rise to change patterns of neuronal connections which give rise to the different forms of thinking and behavior. This is expressed as top-down action from the mental level, as it says that from social factors, developmental factors, to the details of the neural connections, because these act down exactly as Dennis Noble said to alter the gene expression at the bottom levels. And this is Eric Kandel's uh, article in the American Journal of Psychiatry. Now, we've got adaptive neural networks, and this is a kind of a, 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 a computer model of it, deep neural networks. Brain plasticity of macro level is enabled by changes in synaptic weights at the micro level based on experience via suitable gene expression, as Eric uh, Kandel has just said. And what happens at the micro level is that you've got the um, dendrites, you've got the cell body, you've got the axons, and then you've got you go through a synapse to the next one, and you get a, a spike channel going, a set of signals going along from there through to there, through to there, through to there. The brain is made of these interconnected neurons. Information flows from the dendrites to the nucleus to the axon to the synapse onto another neuron through guided motions of electrons. When built into neural networks linked by synapses in the neocortex, the resulting action potential spike chains are the basis of logical thought and other mental phenomena. And no, we don't know what that coding is, you might get misled by some of the popular science reading about that. We have no idea how specific thoughts are coded in these action chains. So what happens here is that you've got these channels here in which sodium flows in, potassium flows out, sodium flows in, potassium flows out, and that causes the movement of the spike chain that way. It's through, through these ions flowing in and out. And there, the, the channels are open and the channels are closed, and that causes the shape of this, um, this spike train. And it happens through the voltage-gated ion channels. The branching logical function that emerges in the brain is enabled at the molecular level by particular proteins, namely voltage-gated ion channels, embedded in the axon and dendrite membranes. They control the flow of potassium, sodium, and chlorine ions across the membrane, leading to action potential spike chains propagation along the axons and dendrites. The ion channel structure results in branching dynamics with the following structure. If the voltage is greater than V0, then allow the ions to flow. If it's less, then do not allow it. So it's this if-then-else kind of branching structure. This downward function from the axon to the ionic level is enabled by changes in the three-dimensional conformation of the ion channels. These proteins are selected in order to perform their function by Darwinian adaptive processes, and it's really important. Adaptive selection, Darwinian processes, they change the, the shape of the molecules here. And the effect of the lock and key molecular mechanism here is that a neurotransmitter binds there, it changes the shape and it allows that to go through. Now, how is that possible? And it, it, what has to happen is that there has to be a molecular interaction has to shape what happens at the proton and electron level. So let's get a model of this. Let's take our, our pendulum and now let the change, let the length of the rod change with time. In that case, do exactly the same thing, and then the initial data does not determine the solution because of the time variation and the constraint. It's the length change of time that controls the dynamics. 
And so signaling the molecules convey information, they alter gene expression, and they do so by changing the shapes of molecules it binds, and the effect of the binding is to change the shape of the molecules. And that's a notional diagram of conformal channeling via signaling molecules. This changes molecular shape and hence alters the Hamiltonian and the dynamics, as in the case of the pendulum with varying lengths. To do this, you need, this is Karplusson's Nobel lecture states, evolution determines a protein structure when in many cases they're not more is made up of relatively rigid units that are collected by hinges. They allow the units to move with respect to each other. There's a signal, usually the binding of a ligand, that changes the equilibrium position between the structures with the two rigid units in different positions. And so what you do is you write out the, the Hamiltonian with the kinetic terms and the potential terms, and you then use the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. The ions is fixed, and the electrons is varying. And in that case, these quantities, rho i i there, are now time dependent, and they are changed by the molecular signal which comes down according to what Kandel said and according to what no, no, um, Dennis Noble said, and that is the way by changing those constraints, which are, these are now constraints because you using the Born-Oppenheim approximation, that is how the, the biological signals come and change what is happening at the physical level. And so what happens here, think of a brain in which I have learned Maxwell's equations, and if you could reproduce my brain at this moment, every single detail of the connections, the excitations, in a, another brain, that brain would also have exactly the same information as mine. It would know Maxwell's equations just as mine does. But the question is, how did Maxwell's equations get into my mind? And the answer is by a learning process. And according to what uh, Kandel said, that learning process took place by changing genes. And so my, my, at the lower level, I didn't know Maxwell's equations. I do know them. That took place by a learning process that's taking place when I was taught in a, in, in, in a con social situation, and that has changed what happens there to there. This does not determine what happened there without that top-down co context of learning. And so you get diachronic emergence from that initial state there up to that state there is affected by the top-down mechanism. Computer algorithms are a definitive example, again, of the causal power of abstract entities. In digital computers, the key causal element that control what happens is algorithms such as quicksort, these are abstract entities that are realized at each level of the software hierarchy and then control the hardware. Um, but the, the electrons flow in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the transistors in accord with the logic of quicksort, if that's what you're running on your computer, translated in a binary code. Physics doesn't determine those algorithms. It's the abstract logic of these algorithms that determine what happens, not the physics. And the world, there are many, many abstract entities that have causal powers, and perhaps I'll finish off just with this one. The rules of chess are abstract social agreements that evolved over centuries. They have causal powers. And that, they constrain the possible movements of the pieces on chess on a chessboard as if they were a force field. How do they do it? By the mechanisms that I have explained.